Good evening, everyone. My name is Anakshi Sopti, and I'm the CEO of the Asia Society India Center. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our program today. For those of you who are joining us for the first time today, Asia Society is a global educational organization whose purpose is to navigate shared futures for Asia and the world across policy, arts and culture, education, sustainability, business, and technology. At the India Center, we focus, among other things, on curating programs that recognize and foreground the diversity of contemporary art, film, literature, and regional artistic traditions from not just India but across South Asia. We have some exciting programs coming up in the next two weeks, so do follow our website and social media handles to know more about what we do. The discussion today titled Art Plus Technology is the third and final program in our three-part series of virtual conversations developed in partnership with Bloomberg. The series looks at new and unique developments within the field of contemporary art across Asia with cultural practitioners, thought leaders, artists, academics, and creative innovators. Today's webinar will investigate the relationship between art, technology, and research today. Moving beyond NFTs and digital art, the conversation will delve into the origins of this relationship, how technology can be used as a methodological tool to record and archive the contemporary moment within cultural forums, and the importance of expanding disciplinary boundaries to activate one's imagination. We have a truly esteemed panel of speakers with us today, so without further ado, let me introduce Pallavi Paul, who will be moderating the session today and will also introduce our panelists. Pallavi is an artist whose practice interrogates how the idea of truth is produced and imaged in public life. She's particularly interested in poetic explorations of the tension between the document and its aesthetic utterance, the documentary. She has exhibited extensively across India and internationally and has recently been awarded a doctorate in cinema studies from the School of Arts and Aesthetics at Jawaharlal Nehru University. A tiny bit of housekeeping before we proceed, we'll end the program with a Q&A session and we encourage all of you to post your questions in the Q&A box throughout the program. For our audiences on Facebook, please drop them in the comment section. Thank you for joining us this evening at Asia Society and a very big thank you to Bloomberg for facilitating the program and the series. Pallavi, over to you. Um, thanks so much, Inakshi, and um, thank you everyone for joining us. A big thanks to Asia Society for inviting this panel um, and proposing a conversation around art and technology. Uh, before inviting our distinguished panelists to present, um, who all of us are eagerly waiting to hear, um, perhaps it is useful to sort of synthesize some uh, conceptual and atmospheric prods uh, for today's talk. Um, in many ways, um, the works of both our speakers, Iftikar Dadi and Ashudha Brata Sen Gupta, bring our attention to the fact um, that art and technology um, have always been intertwined. Um, and to think of them as uh, distinct from one another produces um, almost this sort of um, a counterintuitive artistic uh, obsolescence, uh, in, in addition to, of course, you know, a technological obsolescence. Um, so the, the world of their works, I would say, um, is shot through with technology, uh, right? In their works, um, sometimes it appears as a, a sort of a haptic and epidermic uh, thing, you know, in terms of handprints, fingerprints, um, sometimes as um, electric flamboyant choreographies of light. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of Elizabeth and Iftikhar's neon works here. Uh, you know, um, the works of these practitioners is also often, um, you know, uh, involved in revetting exchanges with screens um, that have become our, you know, the material context of, of our work, play, erotics, mourning, especially in the uh, post-COVID-19 world. Um, their works also address, um, you know, how technological um, how technological networks can sort of communicate uh, with histories uh, over, you know, across time with a kind of persistent um, irreverence, right? Uh, and here I'm invoking Rux's mediations over the years um, that, uh, you know, practitioners like myself have learned a lot from uh, on photography and the photographic act, 
right um and also uh, you know i'm also thinking of iftikhar and uh, elizabeth's uh, material retranslations as it were right of of like sort of canonized poetry into electronic luminous objects right uh and finally in in both practices uh, technology also appears as a narrative device as a, as a way of telling things right um so it's sort of this thick juice uh, you know if we were to imagine it which is soaked by um images sounds display techniques colors tones um you know uh, tenor of the works etc um so even if the te- uh, technological is not directly addressed uh you know it notifies us of its presence um in in all of these ways right now the question is that if all art is technological uh and perhaps has always been you know and even if we think of the very etymological foundation of the word that technology comes from the greek word techne which is a composite of art and craft um and so if this has always been the case then the question is that uh what is the specific um critical ethical aesthetic coefficients of this entanglement right what do they yield what can emphasizing or looking at technology carefully within the precincts of art actually enable and how do we keep honing our capacity uh, of sensing these coefficients uh, without falling into either sort of you know tired modes of um, suspicion of technology as sort of you know dislodging the the essential aura of the authentic or the unique artistic gesture um that sort of walter benjamin has shown us is in fact sort of fascist right that tendency or to slide into the other extreme which which sort of plays out as this sort of experiential um, celebration or all, all of the time of an unblemished uh, future on on some horizon right um and of course there's been lots and lots of philosophically provocative work on the on the messiness of technology uh and its correspondences with sort of the uneven uh, rhythms and and the chaos of life um and i place the work of our panelists today very much within that pantheon um that is thinking of um, things like time decay uh, renewal memory kinetics inertia as as sort of modes of annotating um this techno artistic imaginary uh you know and very quickly to try and sort of um explain uh, explain this with an example you know in the recent spate of online um, short pandemic film compilation genre you know um a, a short a little film about digital dating actually uh, really caught my attention and the premise of this short film uh, it's titled chhajju ke dahi balle which translates as chhajju street food stall um is that there are two young people who are talking to each other via text on an online dating platform and they both describe their day and their surroundings to one another including this favorite street food stall and the highlight of this sort of remote romance is not only how similar they, their day is but that they actually frequent the same stall Uh, and finally after some you know confidences have been won um they decide to meet in person at this place and the and the time of the meeting arrives and then passes and it's sort of a no show as each waits for the other and it's only then that we actually learn um and they learn that they are in fact two shops of the same name one in amritsar and one in lahore where these star cross lovers were respectively uh, located and waiting for one another so the the absurdity and the sort of this surreal uh, doubling that national borders produce comes back uh, you know especially the one as charged as the india pakistan border comes back to us through this world of online dating right where uh, the technological which is sort of this algorithmic digital dating platform um defers the encounter that it also potentially produces or enables right um and um uh, you know a new kind of poetics of waiting in for which is informed by history but not circumscribed under its weight is kind of invoked so it's like waiting for something around a corner while the background the weather time of day and even place keeps changing right and it's the energy of the transformation which keeps the hope of the meeting alive while also sort of continually shifting um its contextual claim um so the techno technological um you know um uh, can make deferral and realization of something part of the same uh, cadence right 
Um, so the intention of today's conversation uh, will be to address this wide terrain of, of modes and sensibilities, uh, which are both historic and contemporary, uh, of looking at the alliances, collisions, and also the illusions, um, uh, you know, that are produced by this crosstalk between art and technology. Um, I hope that today's conversation uh, and presentations will provoke our habitual uh, thoughts and modes of sensing uh, technology uh, so that we can you know, clearly see and actually move beyond uh, what new media um, scholar Wendy Chun calls the bleeding edge of obsolescence, uh, where things are constantly updated to remain the same. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined on this panel by Iftikar Dadi and Shuddha Brata Sen Gupta. Um, art historian and artist Iftikar Dadi um, is an associate professor at Cornell University's uh, Department of History and the director of its South Asia program. Uh, as an artist, Dadi works collaboratively with Elizabeth Dadi, uh, and their work investigates memory, borders, and identity in contemporary globalization. Um, the productive capacities of urban informalities in the global south and the mass culture of post-industrial societies. Uh, Shuddha Brata Sen Gupta is a member of Rux Media Collective, along with Jibesh Bakchi and Monica Narula. He is also the co-founder of the Sarai CSDS program in Delhi, where a lot of young and unpedigreed practitioners like myself produced our own articulations um, and arguments around art and technology over the years. Uh, both Shuddha and Iftikar uh, also have well-known and globally regarded curatorial research and writing practices. And just like technological time that is discontinuous and contingent, but also productive and energetic, uh, this panel brings together two practices that diverge and overlap in, in crucial ways in their address to the technological uh, while memory and identity play an important role in the perception of the technological in Iftikhar's works and writings, through Shuddha and Raksa's practice, we are um, led towards the, the phantom lives, the eccentricities, the theatrics um, of technology, where the surface stays uh, relevant and very important. Uh, both their practices wrestle with the foundational question of the sway of technological potency on ethics, aesthetics, and sensation. Uh, and I hope the conversation and presentations today uh, will give us a further glimpse into new ways of entering um, uh, within and assembling the terrain of, of art and technology. Uh, with this, I invite Iftikar to address us. Iftikar's presentation will be followed by Shuddha's, after which we will open this conversation um, up to your questions and comments, which you can send to us via um, the chat function. Uh, if the guy over to you, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, thanks. Um, thanks for the introduction, Pallavi, and thank you to Asia Society for uh, for organizing this and inviting us. Um, so my uh, just a little bit about myself is that uh, before I turned to making art and studying and uh, talking about art history, I have a prior background in the sciences and engineering. So. Um, uh, so I've long been associated and fascinated with, uh, you know, science and technology and remain so till today. Um, and uh, also, as uh, Pallavi mentioned, my art practice is in in collaboration with uh, with Elizabeth Tardy. Um, OK, so um, so the topic is very wide uh, and um, uh, I believe that Shuddha will uh, address the, the concept of the techne in his uh, in his presentation. I wanted to focus on. Actually, uh, a curious or kind of an important uh, articulation between um, technology, crafts, and art, you know, in South Asia that uh, for about 150 years, since the time of uh, the mid-19th century, that actually uh, prevents us from seeing the relationships between art, technology, and everyday life, okay, um, and also craft practices. So I have, a, I have a small presentation that I'll try to share the screen here. Okay, so basically, I mean, a number of scholars have worked on kind of the, the, the question of crafts and, you know, their visibility, you know, since really the mid 19th century. Um, Arindam Datta's book is an important, you know, study in this regard. Um, so one, one set of kind of, uh, let's say, uh, positions were taken by George Wood, Birdwood in 19, 18, 1878, sorry, in 1880. 
which was the Paris Universal Ex Exposition of 1878 and the, and the subsequent publication called The Industrial Arts of India. Um, and in this, uh, you know, he, I mean, there's a lot of text, which, but I'll just summarize. Um, and uh, one of the things he, uh, uh, the question that he's uh, addressing partly coming from an arts and crafts background as well, uh, I don't mean to depreciate the proper function of machines in modern civilization, but machinery should be the servant and never the master of men. Okay, and uh, and speaking also about the about the about the artisans of India who are now uh, you know un under assault from uh, from industrialization, basically. So um, democratic village communities to hundreds and thousands uh, to colossal mills of Bombay to grudge and gangs at manufacturing peace goods. Okay. Um, or, uh, you know, the kind of um, romantic associations, you know, these uh, ideologues produced regarding craft, uh, saying things like the mere touch of fingers trained for 3000 years to the same manipulations is sufficient to transform whatever foreign work is placed for imitations in their hand into something rich and, and strange. Um, uh, and of course, this, this, this referred to craft and artisanal practices. For people like Birdwood, there really wasn't fine art in, in India, right? So he says the spirit of fine art is indeed latent, uh, everywhere latent in India, but it has yet to be quickened into creative operation. It has slept ever since the Aryan genius of the people would have ex seemed to have exhausted itself in the production of the Ramayana and the Mahabharat, okay, uh, etc., uh, so there's a lot to be said about this, but basically, um, you know, the, among the positions he takes up is that, uh, you know, that basically uh, that artisanal practices in here in the village and not in urban uh, centers. Okay. And that existing technology is a kind of a frozen artifact that has pre-existed for 3000 years or whatever. Right. Uh, he has uh, this, uh, he, he, he creates a close association of craft practices with Hindu mythology, right? And so that leaves out basically, you know, urban artisans, okay, uh, and uh, etc. And non-religious kind of craft practices and objects that are produced for uh, both for, you know, courtly art, everyday use, okay, and also for export. Um, uh, so craft is seen as this kind of a natural uh, expression of kind of village life, if you will, and uh, it's expressive of life worlds, but it allows for no change in. Um, and finally, there is no fine art, right, in uh, in India. And uh, among the you know his his uh, his notorious comments in 1910 on on uh, looking at a Javanese Buddha is uh, is are very important because he said that um, uh, the Buddha is nothing more than an uninspired brazen image, vacuously squinting down its nose to its thumbs, knees, and toes. A boiled sweet pudding would serve equally well as a symbol of passionate purity and serenity of, uh, of soul. And uh, for those who don't know, sweet pudding is a particularly disgusting, um, you know, form of British kind of food. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so this, it's only then that many uh, sort of thinkers were uh, galvanized into defending and creating a position for uh, uh, for uh, for South Asia or India having uh, a tradition of fine art that was defendable, and that was not until the early twentieth century, as late as that, right? Um, and while the craftsman was seen as uh, working with, uh, even while they produce very complex and you know. Um, uh, objects they are uh, they are seen to work in ensembles that are very uh, let me just say uh, makeshift and uh, and quote unquote primitive so something as complex and uh, difficult to make as a carpet is is uh, is assembled here in the in the karachi jail with this very makeshift ensemble of uh, infrastructure okay um, now the next person i can look at is um, Kumar Swami, whose uh, first important book uh, uh, is uh, Medieval Sinhalese Art. It's an important book uh, for many reasons. Uh, among uh, Kumar Swami trained as a geologist, and among the things he was interested in is process, at least in the beginning of his career. So, for example, he talks about uh, uh, line drawings and text showing processes of pr producing metal that is also part of Medieval Sinhalese Art. But in other ways, it's a kind of a schizophrenic book, okay? Because uh, on the other hand, he also uh, reverts to Birdwood's position, which is that the gouge, the chisel are tools, but the mechanical carver is a machine, perhaps the most stupid yet invented. Um, and um, 
it's essential then for a union of art uh, with labor that machinery should be controlled. And this control can be properly exercised only by the craftsman himself. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so essentially what you have is that you have urban and technological engagements largely lacking in South Asian uh, the conception of South, South Asia, both in terms of its craft and artisanal practices, but also in, in its art until about the mid, mid to even to the later 20th century, right? Uh, so Partha Mitter's book, for example, The Triumph of Modernism, uh, he talks about hardly his, uh, his study looks at uh, artists who engage with various modes, but hardly any artists engage with, let's say, the issue of urban life, okay, in, in, in his study. It's also important to note that cinema in South Asia emerges from the bazaar matrix or from popular matrices and not the art school or the art studio, right? Uh, so what I would contend is that there's a missing history of the relation between technology, art, urbanism, and social hierarchy in South Asia and uh, from the mid 19th to the later 20th century. By the later 20th century, you have, of course, you know, artists, contemporary artists working in uh, you know, ostensibly technological modes, but also urban inform practices of urban informality that's being studied. Uh, what what you have is a really a missing history for about a hundred years, I would say. Right? Okay. Um, and and um, another um, set of associations to bring to this debate would be the the debates taking place in basically kind of you know. Um, 20th century German intellectual history, uh, Heidegger's very important essay called The Question Concerning Technology that uh, really thinks about techno uh, technology as uh, in relation to kind of onto uh, to ontolo ontology or being itself, right? Um, and then the two projects by Walter Benjamin, um, the, his essay from 19, 1935 called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, which talks about how the, the process of reproducibility, uh, you know, uh, uh, creates a waning of aura and the possibility of democratic kind of uh, uh, possibilities, right? Um, but I think the, uh, another project that's very, very important to think about is his last, you know, unfinished project, the Arcades Project, which is a study of 19th century Paris, its urban forms, its technologies, its, uh, its capitalism. And uh, one of the lessons of the Arcades project is that aging and superseded forms of technology and urbanism are particularly freighted with, with, with charge because they, uh, they are able to see beyond the, uh, the, the kind of the dream work of capitalism. Okay. Um, and uh, by seeing through the dream work of capitalism, you are able to kind of look at its structure in a more, uh, in a more enabling manner. Okay. So this is just a very kind of a quick and brief, uh, you know, set of positions. Um, I wanted to turn to just to uh, just to uh, talk of, about a few projects that myself and Elizabeth have done in our art in our art practice. We see our uh, art practice as an intersection at the placed at the intersection of pop art and conceptual art, with pop being uh, thought of being as, uh, you know, the notion of popular in a, in a far more expanded register than just thinking about, you know, pop art as a, as a style, okay, or as, a, as, an expre as uh, associated with late capitalism. Um, so uh, my own background, I, I grew up in Karachi. I, uh, I studied engineering and then art history. Uh, Elizabeth is uh, from the United States. She grew up on the West Coast. She studied art and uh, at the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, and uh, we have been making uh, art together for the last uh, 20 years. Okay. Um, so um, just to show a few recent projects. Uh, one, uh, the first one I'll talk about is a project called Cosmos, uh, which was shown at the Havana Biennale in 2019. And in Cosmos, you have, a, um, you have an installation of, um, of um, of drawings and uh, and uh, and and images that are uh, arranged as a kind of a constellation uh, in 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 the whole space, um, and um, uh, these are drawings of um, and images of um, of basically machinery, right? Uh, machinery produced uh, and uh, advertised in in the cities of South Asia, in Lahore, in Mumbai, and so on. Um, 
uh, speaking about local productive capacities. I mean, a lot of this machinery is uh, made by brands that are local, right? Um, and that uh, are not uh, uh, that 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 are that are that's a significant production, uh, you know, that is happening in South Asia, uh, India, obviously, but also the other countries in South Asia. Um, but it's not really seen. Again, this is one of those missing and occluded histories where we don't think of this and in either in relation to the craft debates uh, or in relation to kind of art. Uh, but these are expressions of, uh, let's say, the the creative capacities, okay, and the engagements with technology by kind of a, a you know wider society, okay. Um, uh, similarly, uh, the uh, the project called Thilisim. Um, is uh, a project that looks at uh, a collection of uh, plastic objects, uh, toys primarily, okay, which uh, which Elizabeth and myself collected in Karachi and um, Lahore uh, and also Delhi uh, from the 1990s. And um, these are objects that are made with plas in plastic um, in very small workshops um, and uh, they're unbranded. So this, for example, is a cassette player that uh, that is branded as Sanyo, okay, or a Japanese brand, but of course it's made in the informal informal economy, and uh, their their kind of production proliferation is really quite invisible, uh, okay. And these are also among the cheapest kind of you know toys that basically elite kids would not play with. These are unbranded; uh, they don't have copyright. Uh, you don't really know who made them, right? Uh, they uh, they rely on uh, both um, uh, uh, forms that uh, that may be available from various places. They they have uh, interesting correspondences with the development of software and the and the question of open source kind of uh, you know software and so on uh, in the way that uh, 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 they um, uh, they circulate they're made and they circulate. Um, another project that I'll um, I'll, I'll talk about is uh, a site-specific intervention that we made in Lahore at for the Lahore Biennale in the summer palace of the Lahore fort, which is basically a 17th century Mughal structure. And um, and this uh, project is called Rozo Shab. Um, it's a neon work that uh, is uh, placed on the floor of the of this very large uh, you know uh, room in the summer palace. Uh, this room is uh, has walls that are about forty feet uh, thick. Uh, so when you're inside the the room, you sense the outside, but uh, at a kind of a remote uh, distance. Uh, there is a kind of a sensorial uh, this location you feel being inside the summer palace, uh, uh, and you distantly see and uh, and see the uh, life going outside. Uh, the summer palace is also. Uh, Next to where the river Ravi used to flow, right? And um, so it's a. This was a project that thought about the flow of river in relation to the flow of time itself, and to, to think about the formality of Mughal architecture in relation to a much more uh, a much more playful way of thinking about a maze structure, uh, the Bhul Bhulanya. Okay, here interpreted as a children's uh, a puzzle uh, that you solve by. Uh, basically, following uh, you know the 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 red line is what gives you the answer. Okay, <laughs> that's the correct answer. And um, so it uh, it both kind of in a sense uh, pays homage to uh, let's say the technology and the kind of form of Mughal aesthetics, but also resists that to some degree by uh, bringing in uh, a form that is uh, uh, thinks about about water which is an important element in in kind of mughal uh, planning and architecture but also resist that in in terms of its form uh, and uh, the way it uh, the form emerges is that you it uh, you know it it kind of flows out from the outside in from this 40 foot uh, narrow window and then uh, meanders across the room and then ends ends up in this in this in this burst um the the work was partly inspired by actually a very important poem by uh, Muhammad Iqbal when he visited the mo the mosque of Cordoba. And uh, it's a poem that begins in a very philosophical way and talking about, um, um, uh, about the passage of time. So this, um, 
he says a silsila roz o shab naqsh kare hadsat so the 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 cycle of night and day is the architect of events or of history itself right and in an, in another verse he says the silsila roz o shab tare hari re do rang so in other words the passage of time or the cycle of night and day is a two two twine silken um uh, uh uh rope night and day that alternate and create kind of uh, history itself um another series at um uh, called logos that you might find on these uh, objects made informally so these are of course logos that are maybe carved on uh, the small plastic uh, objects that are made uh, but you don't actually know who made them and uh, what's interesting is that they they can occur in different languages so this is actually cyrillic okay uh, so this is probably an object that if that came from the soviet or the russian kind of sphere and then was reproduced locally and uh, this is a this is a logo that's written in in urdu but of course nobody would recognize this right um, because it's not uh, uh, it's not a branded object that uh, uh, by made by a transnational corporation but really uh, uh, an in, an invisible production of the from the from the informal markets and uh, productive capacities of these large cities in south asia uh, a florescent series looks at um, basically uh it's a series of floral forms that uh, uh that are about 4 feet across and uh they represent the national flowers of various you know countries and regions right and uh or attempt has been to think about national flowers of uh, of regions especially contested regions but basically that covers the whole world right so we also think about uh, about 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 form about color about the kind of formal relationships that take place in them and it's a combination it's a work that's com- combines neon along with uh kind of uh of, of uh incandescent bulbs right and this is really a much older technology this is a technology that uh that really is uh, you know part of las vegas signage and hong kong signage and so on and it's really being replaced today by kind of led so the so or kind of recourse to let's say the superseded you know and older forms of technological kind of uh, production is also in some ways thinking through the 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 insights that we glean from benjamin's arcades project right to think about uh, the waning of affect okay and it's kind of rearticulation in new forms that 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 are placed at this intersection of conceptual art and and kind of uh, the popular right and the final project i'll show are a series of um, film uh, film se- film film stills uh, which are used uh, which are made by using uh, a long exposure time so that multiple frames are uh, are captured in it and they create a sense uh, they create the sense of urdu cinema um, which was being shown in tv in the 1990s uh, in pakistan uh as a, as also a kind of a dream work okay as a as a way in which you have this uh, images that flicker and uh and uh, mesmerize and create a sense of uh, immersion in in its kind of sensory world right and uh so let me go back and say again that cinema doesn't begin in the art sphere in south asia right it, it emerges in the bazaar matrix right so uh, for a long time cinema and art didn't really have much of a communication with each other despite the fact that south asia being among the largest and you know most important film production centers in the in the world so i guess my uh, you know i lend here by saying that um, uh, that one needs to really think about uh, one shouldn't assume of course art and its making is always technological in the sense that it 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 necessitates the manipulation of you know material sensory and uh, you know kind of um, uh, conceptual and affective kind of uh, modalities right uh, in ways that are available to the its makers at any given time that they are living in so in that sense art is always technological but the way we've thought about art and technology has not been a very good relationship in other words for the last 150 years or so okay and in some sense we are not still not completely outside the colonial paradigm okay which kind of in a sense denigrated technological achievements of the 
pre-modern era, uh, continue to denigrate the work of artisans and craftsmen who tried to engage with technology during the colonial era, okay? And then uh, notions of authenticity that na nation states came up with of, um, of, of, of cultural authenticity also denied kind of the, the legitimacy to many artists who were uh, trying to engage explicitly with technology, okay? So I think it's only in the contemporary era that these relationships have opened up a bit freighted by this, uh, you know, this unfortunate history, let me put it that way, okay? Uh, so let me end here. Uh, and uh, perhaps we can revisit these or other questions in the discussion. Uh, thanks, Iftikhar. I, uh, I think we should jump right into Shuddha's presentation now and then keep questions and responses for the end. Um, thank you, Pallavi and Iftikhar. Um, that was a wonderful way to think, Iftikhar. You took us through such a great uh, sort of journey of thinking about practice. Um, can I share screen? Okay, so I want to jump straight in by talking about a term that both Pallavi and Iftikhar have referred to, techne, um, or its uh, homologue in Sanskrit or in various other Indic languages, shilp, um, which sort of renders oddly here. Um, but shilpa or techne um, are words for art and of technology and of ways of doing things. And that's what I find very fascinating is that they're actually both ways of thinking about either projecting a human capacity um, through a machine or through devices or through a, a certain con condensation of information, or they are prostheses, they are substitutes and therefore amplifications of human senses or human capacities themselves. And in the um, sort of textbooks of, of aesthetic practice in ancient Indic civilizations, you get various lists of the arts. And there's a popular one called the 64, Chosat Kalai, which always um, amused me because it, it included, uh, for instance, the art of, um, of fabricating barbarous or foreign sophistry, which I always found to be quite a favorite of mine. Um, that, that, that this itself, that this sort of con job was itself considered a bit of an artistic practice. Um, art of designating a literary work as a medical remedy. Um, the art of the use of lexicography and meters. Uh, in Rux Media Collective, we are obsessed with dictionaries and make, make lexica, lexicons. So it's interesting for me to think about the fact that these are in some senses anticipated in this much more expanded definition of what techne shilp art can mean. Um, in fact, it comes to the heart of the matter of how even in, in, in Aristotle, techne is described as the method of doing things so that even politics becomes a techne. Um, and he makes a distinction between two kinds of techne, techne that are means to an end, that help you achieve an end, and techne that are ends in themselves. And politics is supposed to be a techne that is an end in itself. Uh, much of contemporary art, I think, is not um, is is in that sense a philosophical practice. It is an end in itself. It produces effects that are meant to be uh, encountered as we confront them, uh, which makes me think about the work that we are doing right now in Braunschweig in Germany in in a Kunstverein in a show called The Laughter of Tears. And perhaps if I show you uh, a video, it will somehow encapsulate what I'm talking about. This is from the install this morning we're setting up. And you can see this large screen, uh, which is an LED screen, a technological object of considerable so sophistication because it, it is not a projection. It is not a video screen of the, of the conventional kind. It is actually a video screen that is built up of pixels so that you can encode information into it very differently from the way you would encode it into a video, normal video screen. It is perfectly visible in daylight. So it's a technology that has been meant for this time for, for let's say advertisement or for public signage, public um, sort of image making of all kinds. And the image that you see is a very slow video that we have made, which is an electron mag microscope magnification of a human tear. 
of tears. And I think what interests me in this particular moment is the coming together of various things, technologies of, of reproduction, that is video, digital video, technologies of presentation, the LED screen, and the technology of magnification that produces an image as remarkable as the microscopic study of human tears, with which you get into all sorts of ways of thinking about emotions, about what it means to cry, about what it means to weep, and what it means to encounter a, a human teardrop, maybe, you know, a million, uh, hundreds of thousands of times its own size um, as a work of art. So what does this do? Here again, you see a few clocks that uh, Rux keeps making. These are uh, eccentric Bengali clocks. They, they swing or are cantilevered between desire and brightness, between limestone and lust. And they produce a, a sense of the day that is its own poem, but also then goes back on the technologies of clockwork, clockmaking, of finding a means to represent time and its variation, and the technology that is words, that is language, because that is also a kind of technology. So in our work, we've always found ways and means to think with technology, like if the car, my formation did not take place within an art school, it took place within a film and media school. So our acquaintance with technology was very, was, was very foundational. We went to the same school that Pallavi went to. And by, by having that hands-on attitude towards the making and the crafting of images and work is how we learned to produce sensations and sensoriums. So our understanding of practice from the very beginning in Rux was very heavily invested in, a, um, in an engagement with the technological as a mode of life. And this history of technology is an old one. Uh, we've been working for a while with histories of technology in South Asia. This is an early robot, if you like, an early automaton uh, made for Tipu Sultan, the, the former, the, the king of Mysore. Um, and it's a form of politics because it shows Tipu's favorite animal, the tiger, sort of attacking a, uh, an, an, it's an, it's an instrument of war. It's a musical instrument because actually it plays sounds. It's right now in the Victoria and Albert Museum as an effigy of conquest. And we did a long work on this automaton, this hybrid between human being and animal, between man and machine, between craft and technique, between art and politics, as a way of thinking about all these intersections that, that repeatedly present themselves in our histories. Here is another image that we worked with, and we work a lot with photography. It's an image by a man called Felice Beato. It's taken in 1858, uh, and it describes a moment a few months after um, the, the mutiny of 1857, um, and it, it's uh, located at a site in Lucknow called Sekandrabagh. And it's a remarkable image because it's a very long exposure. It's a primitive camera. And within it, you see a setting, a, a kind of stage set where there are these actors and a horse, three men, four men and a horse. And in the foreground, a large array of human remains. This photograph attracted our attention and made us think for a long time because we realized that one way of looking at the photograph is by, is by seeing it as a kind of time machine. You realize that the photograph is trying to index a moment in time in 1857, but is actually much later. It is trying to tell us a story about a defeat by pointing to the human remains of the fallen soldiers. But if you think through the technology of forensics, you realize that the bones that you see are too neat to have been of the rebels of 1857. That there must have been earlier bones that must have been dug up, excavated, put in the ground, and then photographed. So this, this image is actually an elaborate machine of meanings with many ruses, with many kinds of subterfuge to try and create a new story. So therefore, it compelled us to make a work, a work of theater, actually, in which the, the image itself becomes a protagonist. 
its dissolution, its reformation, its gradual revelation, and a discussion of the technology of forensics that allows us to conclude um, in some form about the time of death that this photograph indexes leads to a huge medita meditation on history, on politics, on, on mortality itself, and on the technological means of representing life and death. So I held up these few examples for you because it's ways of thinking about how an art practice actually works with technology. In our practice, uh, conversation is the primary medium. We are a collective, so we are three people, and I'm sure it's the same between you, um, Iftikhar and Elizabeth, that one has to constantly create memoranda of what we think. And this is in a um, snapshot, actually, of an afternoon's conversation between our three computers in our studio in Delhi and the world. And this snapshot, which, tra which traces the traffic of signals between our machines, is itself a moment in time, and it's also an indication of the intensity of transactions and what goes on between our minds, our hands, our eyes, and our consciousness. So this became a, a, a basis for a, for a short film, um, which is a meditation again on the relationship between anybody and um, everybody, somebody, and antibody, which in this pandemic time, although this film was made much earlier, became very became kind of resignified as a form of thinking about the presence of foreign bodies and antibodies in our in, in our corporeal um, apparatus itself so the technology itself became a way of thinking about the relationships that we have across each other as bodies a form of indexing a conversation the history of a practice and the basis of the archive that produces the future of its of its work of all the production that the that the artistic practice itself makes. Um, so thinking about these things uh, makes us wonder what role can technology play in our, in our life? Here, the same threads of conversation become a kind of cladding for a mode of public transport. Here, they, they cover the seats of a metro train uh, in Gwangju, South Korea. And they've found their way into many other kinds of works by us where our conversation, technologically mediated, becomes then a surface with which we play other meanings and other senses. So we come back to the idea of shilpa, techne, art, and uh, what technology can do and the technologies of the self. Um, in, in popular culture in many parts of South Asia, the god of labor or industry, um, Vishwakarma is a kind of prototypical artist. And I've always found this bazaar print of Vishwakarma very attractive because it, it sort of tells you a story of, of the making of the world. You see, you see an industrial landscape, you see a highly urban surface, and you see machines and tools which are worshipped. Um, and they can be hand pumps, they can be hammers, they can be furnaces, they can be saws, they can be scissors. And they itself create the world, which is the meaning of the word Vishwakarma is the maker of the world. And Vishwakarma is often a, a working class god. He's often a, a deity of uh, the laboring castes. He's not somebody you would find in a, in, in, a, in a bespoke Brahminical temple. His day is the day for flying kites, for letting the imagination run loose, and not of working, but of actually paying homage to the tools of labor. We know from, um, from many philosophical traditions that there is a kind of banishment of practitioners, of artists, of poets, of people who make things with their hands from the polis. Plato famously says that there is no room for artists and people who make things in the polis because they have no time. Their minds are constantly occupied with the making of things. Uh, which is always an interesting uh, school of thought to contend with, particularly in, in, a, in a culture as caste driven as India, where this division of people who think and people who make uh, gets translated into a kind of constant hierarchy, where artists are at best decorators of time. 
And I think it's time for many of us as artists. I mean, I see Iftikhar's practice or I see the practice of someone like Pallavi as a kind of refusal to let oneself be put into this apartheid silo of, oh, you make things so you can't think. Our form of thinking is our form of practice, is our form of making. It is that utilization of the projective and the prosthetic capacities of our thought to constantly create new worlds. And that is the way in which we actually live and fulfill our, our, um, our desires for making a mark in the world. This leads me to a thinking about what we call the new image. Uh, recently, we've been engaged in a, in a series of conversations with philosophers about the veracity of the new image to think especially about the fact that a large part of the, what we call the new image is actually not authored by human hands. Most of the images in the world now come from surveillance cameras and other forms of image making technologies that actually neither require a human eye behind them nor a human hand to author them. They are nevertheless constantly produced and they produce a new, an, a new ontology and a new mechanism of verification. Uh, they're all about the blur. They're all about unresolved images. There is a kind of new forensis to the search for sort of missing images and the images of missing people. In Rux's practice, we're always looking for missing persons notices and notices for wanted terrorists and so on. And these images seem to produce a new sense and a new technological sense of inhabiting the world, uh, where the blur or the distressed image is itself um, evidence of authenticity. Um, I want to leave you with, a, with an image that, that has haunted me for a long time. This is surveillance camera footage from an attack on the library in mine and Pallavi's university. And actually it figures in a film that Pallavi has made uh, called The Blind Rabbit. And it's a remarkable sequence. This is an image that has not been produced by human, human agency. And the policeman in the foreground uh, wielding a baton actually tries to smash the camera. We are accustomed to thinking of surveillance cameras as repressive apparatuses. But here you see the repressive apparatus of the state actually trying to destroy the evidence of its own violence, which leads us to think about a new status and a new ethic of the way we think with technologically produced images. Um, which has a long history because there is a way in which technologies index human bodies to produce images of truth and um, especially forensic truth. So here is Francis Galton, somebody we've been thinking a lot about. He was a eugenicist and he um, produced these remarkable composite photographs. He was trying to get at the essence of the human being through the technology of his time. These are layered photographs, they're layered negatives. Each one of these images is about 100 photographic uh, negatives, and they, they, they layer together to form a superimposition. And he was trying to get at what he used to call the average human being. So this is a series of photographs of the average prostitute. And she ends up being, in his, in his words, Galton's words, like an angel, because the superimposition of the, of the supercomposed figure produces an effect that is sublime and that is beyond so that the individual vagaries of the human face. Uh, we did a long work called The Surface of Each Day is a Different Planet, which is a kind of meditation on Galton, on eugenics, and on the usage of photography for uh, technologies of surveillance, um, which I won't go into now, except just to show you these details of Galton's images. Um, finally, I want to come to another image that Galton worked a lot with, and following Galton, Rux Media Collective has spent a lot of time with. This is a handprint, and I think Pallavi referred to this in passing. It's a handprint taken in the year 1858 by a, a British administrator in southern Bengal. We know who it belongs to. It belongs to a man called Raj Konai, and it's a signature. It's a, it's a form of authentication of a contract of labor, of the, of the uh, conferring of labor on a road work. Uh, so this says that Raj Konai actually did this work and therefore can be paid. So it's the Angut Hachap or the fingerprint magnified. 
What it is, however, is also the ancestor of fingerprinting technology. Because this image reached Galton's laboratory and he started a quest for fingerprinting technology. It went back and forth between London, Scotland Yard, where the police uh, had its headquarters, and the Calcutta police. And finally, two gentlemen of the Calcutta police, Azizul Haq and Mr. B. Bhattacharya, then finalized fingerprinting as a, as a form of forensic technology. And that biometric technology is the ancestor of all the identity currently trying to survey, control, and inscribe our lives into the book of the state. Um, so this is a work called The Unlikely Intimacy of Digits, which takes Raj Konai's hand and makes of it an animal, makes of it a ghostly present, makes of it a mathematical exercise counting to infinity. The title of the work, Unlikely Intimacy of Digits, dissolves into the acronym or the abbreviation UID, which is also the Unique Identification Database, which lies at the foundation or the base of the Aadhaar card, which is actually the digital handcuff that has now come to embrace millions of Indians. So from a handprint at a roadworks in 1858 in Southern Bengal, to Francis Galton's laboratory, to Rux Media Collective's discovery of this technological trace to the Aadhaar card is a very long story that can be told in the motions and gestures of one hand that is inked into time. Um, I'll stop here for now, and I'm sure that there'll be lots of questions for us all to take afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Iftikar and Shuddha, for those uh, really uh, fantastic and provocative presentations. I mean, just uh, to go through the thickness of the practice um, with this critical sort of pressure of technology always foregrounded, I think is uh, very, very uh, both productive, but also, you know, produces, uh, also throws out, throws out like lots of questions about time and, you know, um, questions of authenticity that all of, you know, both of your presentations touched on. And these uh, ideas that have become supercharged, uh, you know, in the context of fake news and the political sort of turbulence that we sense all around us at the moment. Um, so, uh, you know, I just want to uh, maybe before, because there are lots of questions in the chat, and I do definitely want everyone to be able to ask their question. I would just uh, want to ask a small question to begin with, which is this, you know, um, idea of the popular itself, right? Uh, which sort of, you know, if the car uh, practice speaks about, um, you know, at length and, um, you know, the, there is a certain kind of um, almost also tension if the car that you, um, uh, you know, uh, mount between uh, art history and visual culture, right? In your popular visual culture, in both your work and your writing. And that the popular as something outside of the Western canonical tradition and also something that's sort of engaged in this uh, uh, kind of battles of legitimacy within its own production context, you know. Um, so, for example, the work with the toys that you showed, etc. You know, um, but in the, also the in the light of the last few years, we have also, uh, you know, seen the sinister edge of the popular, right, which is not necessarily uh, now separate from a certain kind of, uh, you know, repressive exercise also of power and of uh, various kinds of political conservatisms. Um, so my question is that, you know, without, of course, um, uh, you know, falling into the, uh, you know, early 20th century kind of suspicion of technology, um, how does one begin to recalibrate um, this sort of, you know, um, conceptual um, and aesthetic relationship between, uh, you know, the popular as, as a possible site of sort of emancipatory or self-reflexive uh, kind of culture or politics um, and what we, what our, you know, everyday now lived experience of popular through, uh, you know, uh, fake news and forwards and all of this is, is, um, is as well. Um, right. And so that is one question um, uh, for um, Iftikhar, like if if there is a need for that kind of recalibration of uh, looking at the popular as emancipatory. And what Shuddha uh, brought to us, uh, you know, through this, uh, you know, um, 
um, uh, mediation on the surface of the image. So Shridha, one of the essays that Drux has done, you know, which talks about an event-shaped hole. In a way, you were invoking that event-shaped hole through the uh, different works that you brought to us. Uh, and the idea is that what then, this if there is a hole, like if the event itself is sort of this, you know, almost... Uh, which is actually a very uh, also liberating idea, right? That what happens is not of as much, um, you know, of, uh, weight. It doesn't have as much weight as, you know, everything that uh, constructs the conditions of its disappearance um, and how photography registers disappearance. I want you to also come in perhaps at an angle in this idea of, you know, this um, triangulation between uh, this tension between what is perceived tension between art historical canon, popular culture, uh, you know, the role of technology there, because there is a certain kind of, you know, on the one side, there's an endorsement, on the other, there is a reticence. And then what are the different kinds of, you know, um, a, a, a aesthetic overturning? Uh, that what sort of aesthetic overturning does that produce, you know, especially when we think of um, technology, like, for example, the VHS, which makes the tension between the local and the global almost irrelevant, right? It plays uh, generatively with that tension between the local and the global. So if you can sort of, you know, both of you can respond to this, um, uh, you know, lattice of ideas, uh, it would be, uh, it would lead us then into the kind of questions that we have in the chat. So shall I begin because yeah. you asked me? Yeah, I mean, I think the popular has never, um, I mean, this is what I'm saying that um, that Benjamin's formulation is, you know, I mean, I think it was written from a, under, you know, under conditions we need to understand, which was the, you know, the consolidation of fascism and so on. And he saw that the reproducible image and it's kind of, let's say popularization, okay, as being uh, uh, politically enabling, but we know that that's a, it's a more complex story than that, right? In the sense that the popular has should never be immediately associated with a specific political valence, okay? Uh, so uh, something I wrote for the M plus, you know, questionnaire, I'll just read. Um, so um, uh, artists also need to be attentive to the privileges of literacy, class, and social voice they possess they may not simply reproduce an image of the popular in representational fidelity. This is a false gesture of authenticity because it does not account for the discrepant subject positions of the artist, nor does it seriously examine valences of the popular that one might not wish to celebrate or reproduce. Instead, an artist might reflect upon how their work offers a critical intervention in, in this arena. So that's why it's important to I mean, and in, even in the history of South Asia, the vernacularization of languages and it's the print culture also leads to sectarianism, right? So, I mean, in other words, that it's not just now that we have divisions uh, created by popular technologies and WhatsApp University, but this is also an older story, right? Um, so, uh, but on the other hand, it, it also possesses immense capacities. What I was trying to say is that... Um, through the kind of colonial episteme, okay, we've had this very peculiar situation where the crafts, the, cra the, the artisans were fossilized, basically, okay, which they actually were not when they moved to cities and engaged with all sorts of new ways of making a living, okay, those were not seen as artisanal activities, right, and they didn't, so we have this missing history of about 100 years is what I'm saying, right, we either have the Gandhian, you know, spinning wheel, okay, Okay, or we have people who studied in universities. Okay, we don't really have an account of technology as it inheres and, you know, saturates, you know, kind of everyday life in the cities of South Asia. Okay. Um, and it was also absent in the art school, right? So the, so until very, quite recently, you know, I, I mean, of course, artists in a sense engage with, I mean, you can think of technology broadly by, you know, any anybody who works with materi materials and, you know, s sensory, uh, you know, kind of uh, stimulus and with ideas and uh, is engaging with technology in, in the sense of techne, right? Okay. And uh, whether they embrace the most advanced forms of technology available to them or other forms is a choice and that may be choice and, you know, kind of uh, frameworks that may be determined for them or they may have some, some choice in, right? But the way we thought about art and the way we thought about 
neither in the realm of art nor in the realm of artisanal crafts was an embrace of technology possible in south asia until quite recently as 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 uh, in terms of its thinking right mm-hmm. of course artists do end up making work but they do end up making work despite the fact that they were not kind of encouraged to right this is also what i was like you know like, like like cinema doesn't emerge from the art school it doesn't emerge from artist practices it emerges in the bazaar matrix right so the bazaar matrix is a very important source you know it 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 is the it is the creativity of everyday life in south asia right and what is the role of the artist in intervening in that and thinking through that right yeah but the global history of the cartoon yeah. you know also yeah. the cinema is the penny fairs right is the novelty show is the yeah. the you know is the peep show that is also the global history so in that sense um i think this is more of a retrospective uh, perhaps you know search for uh, you know, a canonized origin you know for cinema because cinema emerges as a very popular form you know everywhere across the yeah world. but in europe it also emerges in you know there are serious practitioners who be recognized in cinema histories right um you know german expression is cinema and so on okay mm-hmm. uh you know eisenstein i mean you know what i'm saying is that you know even in the realm of art we think of these people as uh, as important uh, precursors that's not the way we think of cinema in south asia mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay i'm just saying that we have we have real serious problems in the way we have thought about art you know both in the uh, in the, in its relation to technology and also what i may call informal production and its relation to everyday life to technology to modernity Okay, we mm-hmm. haven't really thought through those questions. Right, right. And Shuddha, if now you could come in as a, you're on mute. Um, thanks, Pallavi. I think the triangulation you suggest is very fecund and very productive. Um, it's a triangulation that I'm trying to think of in terms of different roles for uh, the image making apparatus. And I want to try and think this history through a flashback to a film that many of us may have loved, Jane Bhido Yaro, which is actually a film about a missing image. Um, I mean, if you follow the action of the film Jane Bhido Yaro, there's a search for a negative for a particular photograph in which a crime scene happens. It's inadvertently filmed by the people who are filming. They don't know the significance of what they have filmed. but it's there so everybody wants that negative so in, in that um, story the the task of the image is the task of the reporter the image gives us access to the truth right it tells us what 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 is the truth right it tells us what is true it tells us the constituents of of truth i think we've now reached a very different set of circumstances where digital manipulation and its possibilities actually not just don't tell us anymore what is true but they alter reality so we are now living in the time of deep fakes where it is very difficult uh, forensically to distinguish between an image and its referent its sort of manipulated referent because both the, both of them are digital constructs both of them are combinations of pixels there is very little to distinguish at a technological level between the authenticity of a recorded image and the authenticity of a manufactured image so they are possible to place on par and it's gone way beyond the question of photoshop where we one can trace the manipulation this is actually the the making of images itself is is what we're looking at right now so i think that we haven't yet come to grips with or an understanding of the new status of the image and its new evidentiary um, status and what the ethical dilemmas pertaining to the practices such as yours or such as ours will begin to grapple with this question because it it strikes at the very heart the ethical core of what we do of how and why we make images do we make images to tell the truth do we make images to lie do we tell him make images to create stories that tell the truth or do we make images to create stories that cover the stories that need to make the truth possible 
as an apparent force in life. These are questions that I think about all the time. They keep me awake at night because I think we grapple with them on an everyday basis, hour, on an hourly almost basis, uh, because images come to us from all sorts of places. Their provenances are doubtful. Their, their truth values are always under stress and under investigation. And the things we make, we also forget. So there is a new instability to the image in comparison to what used to be its rock solid evidentiary claim. And I think that is something that artists and I am here saying artists, philosophers need to think with and need to move forward with, need to ask a lot of questions with. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that, Chuta. Um, so there are some questions now also in the chat, which I'm going to read out. Um, and you can, you know, uh, respond, uh, Shuddha Iftikar, according to what you feel about your presentations. How did, how does digital, uh, how can digital ethnography be used to explore the digital world of imagination in a more aesthetic sense? There's a question here about ethnography and imagination. And the relationship of the digital to both ethnography and imagination. This is a question by Tejendra Gautam. Ethnography is an imaginative science to begin with. I think we all need to be very aware of that because the frames which ethnography uses to stabilize identities of communities and peoples are themselves constructs of the imagination as a practice that has done a lot of work on the history of anthropological and ethnographic photography, um, we know in Rux that a lot of what we take for granted as tradition uh, or, or uh, the image of a people are, the, are actually the products of uh, the intersection of will and desire, the will of a colonial power or the modern republical state and the desire of people to present themselves in different forms. So, when you say ethnography, what comes to my mind is always the photographer who has costumes of Kashmiri or Himachali folk dresses on hand at hill stations. And tourists go to take photographs of themselves wearing the Kulu cap or the Kashmiri firan and a photograph is taken. Well, that is ethnographic image making. And that's ethnographic image making that is aware of its own ruses and subterfuges. If we, being aware in that sense, continue to do it, then there is a possibility of a reflective practice. If we continue to do it unawares of what we're doing, we're doing, uh, we're freezing people into pictures. I mean, the ethnographic object is not pre-constituted. Okay? It is yeah. constituted through the discipline through itself the, yes, and yes. through pro procedures and, you know, infrastructure. So I think being self-reflexive, which is actually... Actually, anthropology as a field came into this kind of self-reflection in the late 90s. You know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, in the sense that even ethnographic narratives are, 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 are narratives that can be that you can you can uh, they, you can think about literary analysis to parse those narratives rather than them being a transparent, uh, you know, version of the truth. I would say the digital, of course, you know. In some some cases enhances capacities. In some cases problematizes issues, like what Shuda said that uh, if you take a photograph, you know, in the digital age, you know, you know whether it's uh, it's 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 veracity is uh, is much more open to question than in the past. But even in the past, you know, Edward Curtis, for example, when he yeah. took photographs of Native Americans, he he did a lot of things like removing signs of modernity to make them look primitive. Okay, so so ethnographic fashioning is not like new the digital era poses new challenges but this is epistemologically there is these are old problems that uh, that accompany us as we enter the digital era yeah uh, so Bhagya Sharma also asks what happens to traditional indigenous art forms and their techniques and processes with the advent of technology this is I guess in some ways also been already answered by Iftikar in his presentation but maybe Iftikar if you could uh, and Shuddha, if you'd like to come in as well, is tech a bane due to low quality productions or boon to them as they prevent them from fading away completely? But there is no such thing as tradition in the sense that it, everything is living practice that continues. 
it's at some point you go in and freeze it and say, well, this is tradition. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I mean, the whole debate on craft, there is no such thing as craft until the industrial revolution anyway, because before that, everything is made by hand, right? So our very concept of craft emerges as, as already under assault. It's always, always, it's always dying, right? It's always supposed to be threatened. So I think we really have to get out of this frame of mind and think about kind of uh, tradition as not inhering in in a in a in a in a fossilized way with any set of people. You know, I think we just do injustice to um, to 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 basically. You know, the, 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 I also want to say that as artists, we have much more of a voice than most people, most other makers in the world. Okay, so I think it's very important for us to to use this voice to point this out. Okay, and to also to resist the. Uh, the, these these frameworks, I mean, this is what I was, that's why I presented so much on craft practices, because I think that attends very much to us and attends actually to the, the question of social hierarchy is important also, right? Because at some level, the artist in South Asia has escaped the, 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 the strictures of caste, okay, by, you know, they have a position in society and they are well respected, but that's not the case of, uh, of the makers of all sorts of things who live in cities. So who are still freighted with, you know, uh, with questions of kind of um, uh, seen as being underprivileged, as unthinking, as, you know, okay, as unreflective. And, uh, and it's uh, completely not the case, right? So I would urge everyone to get out of these, uh, you know, these tired, you know, formulations of authenticity and tradition as, as much as possible. I agree totally with what Iftikhar is saying. I just want to add one thing to complicate the picture of the so supposedly adversarial relationship between technology and tradition, which is to say that one area where I think that digital technology and the internet has actually been a huge multiplier and um, amplifier of traditional knowledges is in the case of language. And I know this for a fact that in India, we had this hegemony of a language called Hindi, which is the product of a technology of print uh, of the movable type. And it actually killed other languages. It killed Bhojpuri, it killed Maithili, it killed um, Kathai, it killed Magai, it killed uh, Malwa dialects, it killed lots of languages of the broader Hindi-speaking region. It almost exiled Urdu. But I know now that with the with the enthusiasm with which small communities of the speakers and readers of different languages have taken to actually articulating themselves uh, with the great revival, for instance, of Urdu in cities like Delhi or Hyderabad, which is entirely a result of social media or of languages like Bhojpuri or Maithil and of their different typefaces and scripts. It's very fascinating to see that languages that have faded away because of the rise of one modern language mm -hmm. that is Hindi have now begun to reassert themselves. So it, it's a kind of strange uh, feeling for me to witness this. And, and I'm very happy that this is happening. So Shoda, I would even say, I would even historicize that, okay? And say, there's a book called Cassette Culture by Peter Manuel, right? When he talks about how when the, when the cassette player became kind of ubiquitous, then local music production in all sorts of vernaculars and languages started in small cities and all right so so I, you're absolutely right that the digital realm gives us immense immensely more possibilities for connection and so on but i would even historicize that back to you know the question of the reproducibility of you know and and the democratization which actually benjamin's essay does point to to some degree Great. And we have two uh, two more questions. One is a question about the relationship of technology and the archive, for which I think we need another panel. Um, but, uh, you know, if you could just briefly touch upon some uh, some things around that. Um, and also a question again from Tejendra Gautam, who says, uh, who asks, how do you see caste hierarchy in art? So I think the archive question uh, the technology and archive question can then perhaps be uh, linked in some way. 
to the question of caste and i mean there's also you know again archives is there's no one archive archives are also constituted they are either constituted individually or collectively or by institutions and that we have to think of archives in multifarious ways right and of course the digital era and it's you know uh it's uh, its abilities to connect to sort to to organize material gives us new ways to to constitute archives okay and also to access kind of older and existing archives um so uh so the there sort of archive apartheid in the world because i know that for example i'm in the us you know the us Uh, you know the libraries are well funded the museums are well funded they can put their stuff up okay whereas you know you have like amazing collections in south asia and other parts of the world that are not accessible easily right so i think the question of archive is related also to resources and to to organizational capacities uh, and the digital realm of course enables it but there is also we know that the digital realm is not an equal playing field okay uh, uh, precisely due to uh, questions of access and so on um the other i can just answer the other what was the other uh, question uh, the, the, the question how do you see caste hierarchy in art and in fact there is somebody who specifically also asked you another question if the car on your thoughts on the concept of techne yeah so i think uh, you know i i you know techne i think shoda explained in his uh, in his presentation and i'm i'm on board with that which is the which is this broad sense of um of of making your place in the world by by deploying materials uh, you know concepts you know kind of uh, you know sensory you know kind of stimulus and uh, all other means to 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 create a world right uh, uh and and that's a process that happens throughout history and uh, uh by all sorts of people in all sorts of communities right so i think i think of techne in this very very broad sense and not specifically as only the latest technology or something like that okay uh and caste hierarchy i mean i think the story of the 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 fossilization of the artisan is a caste story right uh this is a story i mean this is kumar swami a brahman right talking you know writing about uh, uh you know he, you know craftsmen in 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 sri lanka he's sympathetic to the degree that he can be okay but he's not going to make anything by himself by hand right the, his career also shows that as his time goes on he becomes more and more metaphysical right and more and more less and less interested in process right so so he actually like the first book is more interesting for me from from that point of view because he that it's a schizophrenic book and there are things in it that you can mine i don't find his later work to be that you know i mean he's he's not an art historian he's a metaphysician a perennialist so you don't learn anything from a perennialist essentially except for like jungian you know kind of archetypes yeah yes can we gain the metaphysician and i think it's an unequal bargain uh, but um <laughs> but just to uh, come back to the question of the archive uh, and i already typed this i'd also like to introduce to all of you um, a word that we made up in rucks because when words fail us we have to make them up so uh, and the word is an archive it's a n a r c h i v e because the archive is the record room of the archon in a way of order the an archive is it is the repository of the traces of anarchic imaginations of of the insurgent moment in a way and i think those are the archives that we all or the anarchives that we all produce through our lives and they have um, a strange ephemerality to them and i think in the digital world this is this is doubly reinforced by the fragility of digital traces uh, i mean compared to when we were working in a purely analog world Uh, i mean this the the strongest archives are the ones that are written in stone which is why you can read the edicts of nebuchadnezzar or ashoka or uh, or you know, because they are on very strong materials right now what we have is our hard disks and that's you know that's going to go very quickly digital data is very fragile so there is actually um, although there is a multiplication of archival initiatives because record keeping has become easier there is however a much greater danger of the passing of this data of its 
of its erasure. So I think various artists have to begin to think, artists particularly who are, I mean, we are all getting older, we have to begin to think about what do we do to keep the memories of our practice living? Um, because very often we are not working on, on, uh, on hard copies, we are working with digital data, we are working with instructions, and th those need attention. I am not 100% sure about how to do it, but I know it's something that I have to start thinking about. Um, that leads me to try and answer your question about caste. I think caste is a poison that is present in the capillaries and arteries of every form of life and practice between the rivers Indus and the Iravadi. You know, on the western side from Abbottabad to Mandalay in Burma, that entire, the, the, tri the diamond of the, uh, of the fraction of Gondwana land that hit in Asia is poisoned by caste. And we have to deal with it in every form and in every breath that we take. It's something we can't get rid of. And I am trying to tell you, why this is important. Of course, people like Kumara Swami are, are exemplars of what the congealment of the caste attitude is. But I also think it has to do with this hierarchy that even we produce in our minds of the levels of, let's say, the ontological authenticity or the, or the veracity of different forms of articulation in which, let's say, a form of presentation in particular languages occupies higher status, making occupies always a lower status. Within the visual arts, there is a, there is a constant tussle between the handmade, which often sometimes now gets a purer status to the machine made. I used, I remember very well being told 20 years ago, ki tum to artist ho hi nahi because you work with machines. And I used to take that very seriously. At that point of time, I, I had completely internalized this idea yeah, that yeah. working with machines means that we are not artists. We are, in fact, artisans. I don't have a problem with acknowledging the artisan status, but I want to emphasize the fact that art education and the formation of an artistic cognoscenti or an artistic intelligentsia in South Asia does produce its hierarchies. And I think it's an interesting fact that the three people on this panel come from backgrounds like engineering and filmmaking, which are actually, you know, not very Brahmin in the South Asian understanding of what aesthetics is. Got our hands. So there is now a kind of reception to the digital and it's considered to be sort of a new new code of, of a new Brahminical code. But that was not always the case. And I remember very distinctly a time when an, when an engagement with technology was considered a sign of inauthentic being, was a, as a sign of the pollution of the aesthetic by the technological. And that's caste language. It's a language we have to undo all the time. It, you can never do it enough. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you for that, Chuda, and thanks, Iftikar, um, for your, again, fantastic presentations and for this very riveting, um, you know, Q&A session. Uh, there were many more questions, but unfortunately, we're out of time and we have to wrap this up now. Um, but yes, we hope to continue um, these conversations across different fora. And uh, there's also a lot of reading material um, uh, that has been posted in the chat. Uh, which was kindly shared by Shuddha and Iftikar. So, uh, you know, you can also uh, find out more about their practices and thought from there. Uh, yes, and thanks once again to Asia Society uh, for this invitation. Um, and yes, have a good night, everyone. <laughs>